Welcome back guys to another video of the series Chess 101 where I teach you guys the basics of chess. And in today's video we're going to talk about middle game plans and how to always know what to do in the middle game. And if you haven't seen the videos, the previous videos from this series, I highly recommend you to check out the videos about the do's and don'ts of the opening stage of the game. And now we're going to talk about the middle game stage of the game. This is basically what to do after you developed all your pieces and you get to that point of the game where you ask yourself, so what? What do I do next? But before we begin, if you are not yet subscribed to the channel, I highly recommend you to click the button down below and subscribe for more videos like this one. So let's take this example and check what to do in the middle game. So we have a basic example here of an opening where we play as white e4 and the opponent plays c5, which is known as the Sicilian defense. You don't have to do um, a theory here. You don't have to know the theory. You just have to know how to develop the pieces like we learned in the principled ways on how to play the opening in the previous videos. You're just going to take over the center, develop your pieces very quickly and castle your king, try to connect your rooks. So you're going to play knight f3 here to develop your knight. The opponent's going to play d6, trying to control the center. You play d4, striking the center right away. They take and you take back with the knight. So this is the typical move here in this open Sicilian. Um, again, you don't have to know theory. You're just playing principled moves here, developing your pieces and taking control of the center, castling your king as soon as you can. So your opponent's going to try to develop their pieces. You develop your pieces. Always try to go for knights before bishops. This is a general rule of thumb that is pretty good. Um, opponent's going to develop knight f6. You play bishop e2 here, developing your piece and getting ready to castle. Opponent plays e6 and you castle your king. You're already castled. You have three pieces developed. You have more space in the center here. And your opponent is kind of a little more passive backwards. They can't move these pawns. They can't push these pawns because your pawn is dominating the center with the knights. So the opponent plays bishop to e7, getting ready to cast him, castle himself. And here you're going to play bishop to e3, developing your last minor piece. And your opponent's going to castle now, finally. This is pretty much the opening, right? So you can do this. You can play queen to d2. And now you have connected your rooks because they are, you know, staring at each other. And when they are connected like this, they are stronger because one rook is defending, you know, supporting the other. That's why we have to connect the rooks. And this is, let's say, the, the end of the opening, right? So your opponent plays a move like a6 here, and this is the end of the opening stage. And that's the moment where you ask yourself, okay, I developed all my pieces, I uh, controlled the center, I castled my king, connected the rooks, and now what? What do I do next? And that's exactly the, the question that I'd like to answer in this video. So I'll give you a very simple, very easy method to always know what to do, always know how to find a move in a middle game. I have already done a more uh, in-depth video about this method before. You can check this out in my channel as well. But this one is a very easy, very simple way to find moves when you are in the middle game. And uh, I'm going to show you this in a second. But before we talk about this, I'd like to tell you guys that the best way to actually know how to play the middle game is by checking other games uh, in this opening that you play. So if you are playing, for example, in this case, the Sicilian defense, you should study a little bit. Uh, and some games in this position, especially from master and grandmaster level, so you uh, can check out what they usually do after this point is reached. So you're going to take a step further and see what do the top players do when they reach the, this position? What do they do when they get to this uh, kind of setup? What are their next moves? What are the plans that they usually go for? Well, this is a really good way to know what to do next. You just have to take it a step further. But if this is too hard and you want to play in a more principled way, well, then you can go for this setup that I'm going to show you now. You have to try and find weak squares and uh, pawns in the position. And uh, these weak squares and pawns, uh, you just have to look at the pawn structure of your opponent and you're going to find holes in the position. 
weaknesses in the position. And how do you do that? Very simple. You have to look for especially fifth rank and sixth rank. And if you're playing black, you're going to look for the fourth and third ranks. You have to look for those. And you have to look for squares that are not protected by pawns or that they can't be protected by pawns anymore. And the first square that come to mind here, oh, you can look at the seventh square sometimes too. But first of all, you have to look for the fifth and sixth uh, rank here. You can look at the seventh maybe in the future. And again, if you're playing black, you just have to uh, invert and look at the fourth and third. You have to look for squares that are not defended by pawns or that can't be defended by pawn, pawns anymore. And this is the first square that has to pop to mind immediately for you. Because this pawn right here, this square, it cannot be defended by pawns anymore. Because this pawn is gone and this pawn has been pushed. So this pawn cannot defend this square anymore. And this square from now on, from this moment on in the game, cannot be defended by any other pawns anymore. So this is a permanent weaknesses, weakness in this position. And we can exploit this by just attacking this square and trying to take this pawn. Okay. Uh, uh, not only that, we have some other squares that are weak too, but they are not permanently weak. They are not permanently weak. They are temporarily weak. For example, this one and this one. Why are these squares temporary weaknesses? Because they can be defended by pawns if you push one of them. So if you put, let's say, a piece right here, your opponent can just push this pawn and defend this square. But take a look at this. Whenever your opponent moves a pawn, whenever they push a pawn, they create another weakness. So they are trying to protect this square by pushing this pawn. But when they push this pawn, what ends up, ends up happening is that they undefend this one. This square uh, was protected, this pawn was protected by this pawn before. So if you push it, what ends up happening is you leave this square as a permanent weakness. And now you can exploit. You lose this, but now you have this permanent weakness right here. And of course, what ends up happening is this square is still a weakness and it becomes permanent because there are no pawns here or here to protect this square. So what happens is when you exploit an, a temporary weakness like this one, trying to put a piece here, and they try to push and protect this square, what ends up happening is they create even more weaknesses in the position. So whenever your opponent pushes a pawn, they create weaknesses. This is a temporary weakness as well. Actually, this one is permanent. Yeah, there are no pawns here or here. So this is a permanent weakness anyway. So uh, there's nothing that black can do here to protect this square. These two weaknesses are permanent in the position because these are squares that cannot be defended by pawns uh, any longer. So uh, if you look more, these two squares are also temporary weakness, because let's say if you put a piece right here, your opponent can just push this pawn and it's going to defend this square, but what ends up happening is that when they push this pawn, they create two more holes here, <laughs> and then you can exploit these other weaknesses. So sometimes what we want to do is we want to put pieces in squares like this one, this, or this one, just to, you know, uh, induce our opponents into pushing pawns and generating even more weaknesses. Maybe so we can retreat the pieces. And uh, what happens is we can retreat pieces because knights and bishops, they can move uh, back, but the pawns can never move back. So once they are pushed, they are permanently, permanently moved you cannot go back with them. So that's what we want to do. We want to induce our opponent into pushing pawns. And the more they push the pawns, the more weaknesses they end up creating in their own position. So here, what we can do here is try to gang upon this pawn right here and try to exploit these two uh, main weaknesses that are here in the black's position. And the obvious move that comes to mind here to attack this pawn is to bring this rook here. So we start x-raying this pawn in the future, maybe trying to take it. So this is the, the move that is actually played in this position. Rook a to d1. And why am I playing the rook a to d1 instead of the rook f to d1? Because this rook is already a bit more centralized. This rook was here in the corner. So we want to activate the one that is last active. 
So we are, we are trying to opt for the least active piece to move here. And we are occupying a half open file here. This is just a great uh, move overall. Good uh, in, this, in this whole sense. Opponent decided to trade pieces here. So we could take with the bishop, but we decided to take with the queen here. So we keep pressuring this pawn. We cannot take it yet because it's protected, you know, by this and this. So we cannot take it yet. Otherwise, we're just losing a queen, but we are still pressuring it for maybe attacking it more in the future. The opponent here ends up pushing this pawn to e5, attacking our queen. So, of course, we have to move the queen because it's under attack, but where to? We can look at this position. A pawn was pushed, and whenever a pawn is pushed, you have to reassess the position and take a look. Well, they pushed this pawn, so they end up unprotecting these two squares. And um, one of them is a permanent weakness now. This square here is permanently weak. It cannot be defended by, by pawns any longer. So this is permanent. This is a permanent weakness. And now we have this hole to uh, explore maybe. Of course, they can defend. But again, they end up creating even more weaknesses. So we can attack these two squares. We can still go here. here. Remember, this is a permanent weakness too. So what we can do here is that we can simply retreat our queen if we want, but we can also go for this, right? And try to um, infiltrate with our queen into a permanent weakness. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We play queen to b6, opponent takes the queen, and we take back with the bishop. Now we have this bishop in a square that it cannot be kicked out of. This square here is 100% safe for our bishop because it cannot be attacked by any pawns, right? So it's a weakness. It's a, a hole here in the position. Of course, opponent can go here and try to attack, but it's going to be a piece for a piece. It cannot be attacked, attacked, attacked by pawns anymore. So this makes this a very good square to put our bishop in. And again, this square is still a weakness. So we can try to put our knight here if we want, and we're going to do that. This is going to be probably our next move. So we can put this knight in a very strong outpost here, protected by the pawn and by the rook. And this knight's going to be here forever if we want. Of course, the other knight is attacking it. So we are eyeing this square from now on because it can no longer be uh, defended by any pawns. This one as well. So this is a great square for a knight. It's a centralized square. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Our opponent sees that, so they play bishop to e6, trying to control this square a bit more. But uh, we're going to play this move anyway. We put our knight to d d5. Opponent takes. We take with the pawn, because now we're hitting this bishop and forcing it to move one more time. They move bishop to d7 here. And again, every time a pawn is pushed, we have to reassess the position Okay, so we know that our pawn is occupying this very strong weak square here. This bishop is occupying this very strong weak square here. We can still try to attack this pawn. So overall, our position is doing great here. Some pieces were traded, the queens were traded. So this is heading more toward, towards an endgame position. And endgame we're going to cover in another video. But you know exactly where to put your pieces here. You know the weak squares that your opponent has. You can try to exploit those squares right here, temporary or permanent weaknesses. Opponent's going to keep uh, pushing pawns too. We're going to solidify this pawn here. Very strong pawn we have in the center. It is uh, making it difficult for your opponent to move pieces and taking a lot of space here. Opponent's going to try to attack our pawn here. We're going to solidify even more, pushing b3. Um, here, they're going to try to get rid of this, this very strong bishop that we have here. We can go ahead and trade. We don't have to, but uh, in this case, actually, we do. We could retreat, I guess. We could have uh, just go back here, but uh, no rush. We can trade. And this is heading towards an endgame. Uh, we have most pieces were traded here. A lot of minor pieces. There are just one minor piece left. We have the two rooks still. And the queen is not on the board. So whenever we don't have the queens and we have less material on the board, this is not a middle game position anymore. This is more like an end game position. And here we have a great game. 
and uh, we got out of the opening very safely, and we could play the middle game in a really good way as well. So this is pretty much how you find moves in the middle game to play. And if you like this method, remember to please leave a like in the video, leave a comment down below as well, tell me what you think. And as always, I see you guys in the next one.